The number one snake on our list is the carpet python. Now carpet pythons generally like to live in areas that are off the ground. This can mean anything from the inside of a hollow log to the top of a tree. In urban areas of southeast Queensland, you're likely to come across these guys living in the roof or walls of a house or in a tree in the backyard. They are very, very common, hence our number one ranking. And for the most part, we'll just curl up and sleep until they get hungry. All right guys, this is a young carpet that we've um, only just recently caught. Now what I want you to understand that out of all the breeds of snakes here in the Gold Coast, the two most common are the green tree and the carpet. It doesn't matter what street you live in, it doesn't matter what suburb you live in, you will get those two breeds of snakes. Now a lot of people hear me say green tree and carpet. They assume that they all look exactly the same. Green trees do not have to be green, carpet pythons do not have to look like this fellow. Now we're probably going to um, film quite a few different breeds of carpet pythons over the next couple of days to give you an idea that they can be very, very dark in colour, they can be very light, they can be dotted, striped, speckled. Some of them, when they're born, they're only 20, 30 centimetres and when they're adults, they can be quite large. The record, I think, in, uh, of carpet python size is 4.3 metres. The biggest one I've caught is 11.5 kilos. We've actually got one here that's 9.75 kilos to show you in a little while to give you an idea of how much they can vary in size and colour. Now if you have a house or a yard that attracts rats and mice, then you're also inviting this snake and others to live in close proximity to you. Now having a carpet python living in or around your home is usually not such a bad thing as they eat any rats and mice that might be about and that helps keep the number three snake on our list away from your place. Carpet pythons can grow to a pretty big size, up to four metres long, but generally you'll find them in the one and a half to three metre range. Carpet pythons are not generally aggressive. If discovered, they're more likely to stay still and wait for you to leave before they move on themselves. However, just like any snake, if it's provoked or threatened in any way, it will attempt to protect itself by biting. Remember I mentioned earlier that um, the carpet python is a non-venomous snake. It doesn't do any damage to us humans using venom, but what they are is a constrictor. Now you can see it's hanging onto my arm pretty tight there. It's actually quite incredibly tight, so much so that it's cut the circulation off. You can see a lovely blue hue to my hand. Now he is quite capable of probably quadrupling the grip that he's got on my arm now. Every now and then when I catch a carpet python and they are quite upset, I'll give it to you and they'll for just a split second give you every ounce of their strength. And from this size upwards, quite often you feel as though, gee, it's going to break my arm. Now, remember I said earlier that they're not venomous but they've got nearly 200 teeth. What I'll do here, if he's going to let me, is open his mouth. You can see two rows of teeth there. If I pull the gums back, you can see the length of the teeth, you can see three of them there. So you can see there's just three there, so all the way down this jaw is probably what, 50? Then there's that jaw there, and then two centre two centered rows of jaws. And if I can get him to open his mouth a little bit further, see that hole in the middle of the top of his mouth? That's where, when they poke their tongue out and smell the air, they stick their tongue up into the roof of their mouth, which is called the Jacobson's organ. That's basically a direct link to their brain. So instead of stuck, sucking the air in through their nostrils and breathing it like we do, they get the particles of air on their tongue and then stick it directly up in the organ which gives them an instant readout saying this is animal, mineral or vegetable. Now also you might be able to notice on his bottom jaw if we can see with a bit of light there, see that funny looking snorkel looking thing that's quite sharp but you'll see it open, see it opening now and taking a breath. What that is is called the galottis. Now it's like a snorkel or a tube. You can imagine an animal like this carpet python that eats a fruit bat or a possum or something that's well and truly larger than his body he's going to have his throat blocked for over an hour. So you think, how does he breathe? What he does is he actually sticks that galottis out the side and uses it just like a snorkel. You see me taking a breath now, open up. Now snakes have two lungs just like us. One of them is only very small and only use, does a portion of their breathing. And the other one is rather large, going all the way down their body. Now that large lung they use all the time, but when their throat is totally blocked with a large feed going down, they live or stay alive by using that galottis or that snorkel and the small one. They're pretty, pretty, pretty little animals. Now what else I want you to take notice of, once I pull my sonny's out of his mouth there, see these little heat sensing pits, there's about six of them along the bottom jaw, on both sides. Also on the tip of his nose, there's one, two, three, four. They're a little bit difficult to see because of camouflage. But these guys are heat sensing pits, and he cruises around in your roof or in a tree, and he can sense where animals have been. So those pits pick up one tenth of a degree change in temperature. And what happens is mice and rats run around your roof, and they use the same beam or same track all the time. He can go 12 months without a feed. He cruises along, smells the rats and mice using his tongue, uses his heat sensing pits and goes, yep, this is where they hang. I'll just call up and wait here. And the rats and mice, basically the smorgasbord comes to him. Young carpet pythons, or all, all, all snakes for that matter, when they're young, they feel threatened by us humans or by anything that's bigger than it, and they will bite. So if this guy does give me a nip, don't panic. He's only got small teeth. 
and it will barely break the skin. But I wouldn't be surprised if he does give a nip at all. At this size, he will get up in your roof, he would find himself a brick with a hole in it, he would curl up there and he would probably spend the first 12 months of his life looking, hunting down geckos, looking for little mice. Once he gets to about three times his size, then his diet will change over to just about pure mice. But you can imagine how easy it would be to make a mistake on the identification of this snake here. The most common size carpet python found in people's houses are around one, one and a half metres. But I want you to understand that when they're born, they're not much bigger than a pen and they can live for quite some time and they never stop growing. Here we have a rather large carpet. It's not as big as the biggest I've ever caught. I've caught much bigger than this. Now to give you an idea, I actually weighed this carpet. This carpet weighs 9.7 kilos. Another snake catcher caught one that weighs 18 kilos. So you can imagine it's literally double the size of this. Now, unfortunately, because of the urban sprawl in human habitat, it's very difficult for a snake of this size to live without getting seen by people and dogs and things like that, and therefore they get themselves into a bit of trouble. Carpet pythons are egg layers too during the breeding season. One of the reasons why you will find them on the ground, usually they're either sick, or they've got a huge belly full of food, or they've uh, got a belly full of eggs and they're about to lay. So when it's time for them to lay their eggs, they'll come down and find an appropriate spot, which will be moist and dark, away from more dramas with birds and humans and whatnot. Once they've found a spot, they'll make like a nest and they'll lay there till the day they have to lay. Once they've laid their eggs, they're actually maternal. Those guys will look after the eggs. They can raise the temperature, seven degrees. And if by chance it doesn't rain for a couple of months, they can also raise the humidity by urinating on the eggs. Sounds horrible, but it works. Another way that they'll keep the eggs warm is they'll come out and lay in the sunlight, which will bring the temperature of their body up. Then they'll go back to the eggs and they'll transfer the temperature of their body to the eggs. The eggs need to be kept around 31 degrees. Now here's a pretty amazing fact. If by chance the eggs are all fairly cool throughout the gestation period, they'll all be females. If by chance it's on 31 degrees, they'll be females and males. If it's really, really hot, they'll all be females and they'll be really, really, uh, not all females, so they'll all be males and they'll all be really, really cranky. And also sometimes if the temperature's way too warm, it causes all sorts of over-incubation deformities. That kink in that carpet python's back could very well be one of those. I actually did a job um, yesterday where a lady had just had a pest controller out, paid him a couple of hundred dollars to have the rats removed, and then wanted me to remove a carpet python. And in effect, that carpet python was doing her the best favour in the world for free, removing all the mice and rats. That means she was getting a decent night's sleep. Also, her house was not being chewed by the rats and mice and causing fires. And there's no dinner bell ringing for the eastern browns and other more venomous snakes, which, you know, it's got to, do, it's got to tell you something. These guys are good to have around.